Well, this is great. I feel like I'm doing a stint on a TV night show. This is, love the stage. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so as you just heard, we're going to be talking here. Actually, what I think is the, is the crux of this, this entire uh, conference, and thank you, Beryl, uh, folks, for putting this on. Great event. Um, Ray, what we're really talking about here is how do we institutionalize the crypto markets? How do we, what are the things from uh, traditional markets that we need to bring into the digital asset world? What's the institutional grade infrastructure that's going to be required in order to spur on uh, institutional adoption, or at least it's a wide scale institutional adoption in this market? At KPMG, our clients are of institutional size, or we have pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, uh, some of the largest uh, allocators in the world. And when I speak to them about what they're thinking about when they're exploring coming into the digital asset world, it's always safety, security, what's the infrastructure, what's the regulation around this? So those are the questions that, that they're posing before they step into this space. And so with, with that as a backdrop, you know, Jenna, Chad, you guys are both uh, at large exchanges, and so I'm wondering what you, you, you're in the greatest spot, the best spot to see the, the institutional flow that comes into the space. So what is it, what is it you're seeing, and what, where are we right now at this point in time on institutional adoption? Jenna, I'll start with you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so a bit of background about who we are and what we do. LMAX Group has been operating exchanges um, for foreign exchange around the globe for the last 12 years now. And in 2018, we moved into offering spot crypto as an alternative asset class for our clients, um, really on the back of client demand. So a ton of our, our clients typically would be banks and large high frequency trading firms. And in 2017, um, more so the HFTs, they were really knocking on our doors and asking us to, to do something like we do in foreign exchange for the crypto market. So ultimately, they were market making on a ton of retail crypto exchanges, but didn't really have a venue where they could offset some of their risks, trade with like-minded participants. Um, so that's how our crypto offering really came about. How could we service our existing clients um, on the crypto side of things? So, so we launched Selmax Digital to do exactly that. And um, it, it's been pretty successful. Um, we only trade spot crypto today, moving into futures later this year. But what I would say is that the HFT still trade a ton today. We see trading from the likes of funds and brokers. Um, where we've seen a big difference in the last four years has really been the traction from the banks. So given that a lot of our clients trading for an exchange with us will be banks, they kind of run away from us in 2018 when we showed them what we were doing in the crypto space. If you fast forward four years to where we are today, they're, they're all now knocking on the door. So still issues around regulation preventing them from physically touching crypto. But absolutely readying themselves to be able to trade this asset class. So, you know, different variations of the banks, whether that be the repo desks, the FX traders, they are now taking our market data like they would in foreign exchange and exploring and getting ready to be able to, to touch the physical crypto. Great, and Chad, what are you seeing at Galaxy Digital? Yeah, um, hi everybody. So uh, just as like a brief introduction of what Galaxy Digital is and does, um, we are uh, one of the biggest, I guess, digital asset banks. So if you were to envision what a sell-side bank looks like, diversified business lines, that's how we are approaching the digital asset space. So diversified business lines such as research, mining, principal investments, sales and trading, list goes on. So you know where we pitch ourselves in my world, which is electronic trading, is actually on the OTC side. Um, so we are an OTC over-the-counter market maker. Um, and we have lines across electronic trading, uh, derivatives, manual spot trading, et cetera. So it's been interesting. I've been here for about a year. My background is in traditional foreign exchange um, and seeing the evolution from foreign exchange into crypto. Uh, in particular, the topic of kind of exchange trading versus OTC trading has been really interesting. So I guess in terms of the, the topic of institutional adoption, it's been fascinating the amount of conversation I've had with clients or vendors who I spoke to every day in foreign exchange. And it was the same faces that are now in crypto. Um, 
In terms of recent market events, it's been interesting. Um, I guess on the downside, I think being realistic, some of the kind of crypto specific events um, that have gone on have certainly, I think, slowed the pace of traditional institutional adoption. However, on the positive side, as it, as it pertains in particular to Galaxy Digital, you know, because of how sound we've we are and how how we've made it through kind of these recent turbulent times, you know, your traditional asset manager, a traditional hedge fund, who in this space are you going to want to trade with? Someone that kind of looks and feels like what you saw on the sell side and whether you're in equities or FX or whatever asset class, probably. And what we've actually seen is in the turbulence of recent times, you're kind of more, I would label high frequency type players have kind of fallen back to the wayside. And we've been uh, intentionally aggressive which ha with how we are targeting, you know, staying relevant with our clients in these times, keeping pricing stable, et cetera. So my, my kind of summary, I guess, to your question is um, slowing, but I think, you know, the, the adoption is there and, and how we're positioned as a firm, I think, is, is, is really great for, for what's to come. So that's great. So institutional adoption is actually happening now. It's coming in the market. And so on the heels of that, Sam, I wonder from your perspective, you know, at, at an institutional allocator, you know, what, what is it you're looking at? What are you seeing? And... And how, how, are, uh, how does this fit into investors' broader portfolio? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an area that we've been looking at for a while. Um, so Partners Capital, we're an outsourced CIO firm. We manage capital on behalf of a uh, blended mix of large family offices and uh, endowments, foundations, and other institutional investors. And uh, we invest across uh, and all asset classes, uh, and we have teams focused on uh, private equity, private debt, public equity. Uh, I manage our hedge fund and credit team. And, uh, and we create client portfolios that tend to emphasize alternative active management uh, as a source of excess returns. And, um, and, and traditionally, we have had a lot of success focusing on strategies that are uh, where excess returns are skill-based. Uh, we have a, we've invested and partnered with a lot of great investors over our 20-year history. Uh, however, there's also a place in our portfolio for, I, I would say, new niche, uh, capacity-constrained, complex markets and opportunities. Crypto clearly falls in that bucket, in my mind. And, um, and in terms of the opportunities that we've seen, they range uh, pretty much they touch on all asset classes. So we've seen uh, venture capital opportunities. Uh, things that I would uh, relate to private debt, where it's really a picks and shovels credit type of lending business. Um, directional strategies, where uh, you know you just it's it's a bet on a new asset class, and then finally more uh, what I would call traditional hedge fund approach strategies to um, to digital assets. That's what I've personally found the most interesting. Um, I, I've been a little bit reluctant to jump in with in terms of defining a value for where crypto is supposed to trade, how it fits in an asset class, but um, seeing the, the dislocations that are caused by uh, really the, the, the new opportunities and this new market that's becoming uh, formed, uh, new market structure that's still being tested, there's just a lot of idiosyncrasies to take advantage of for uh, really uh, t uh, institutional investors. So that's where we've been focused. We're focused more on market neutral arbitrage type investments um, across different exchanges, across different time scales, uh, across different products. Um, uh, you know, that's where we've seen the opportunities. Yeah, and so like I was saying earlier, uh, you know, institutional investors, as they come to this space, safety and security uh, are, are primary concerns. You know, having the infrastructure and the rails to handle the volume and the size of trades that they like to do. So, you, Boris, I wonder, like you're in a very unique seat because at, at Copper, you're one of the largest digital custodians in the world, and you know that's a key component of what these uh, institutional players are looking for. So I, I wonder, what, what do you think, or what are you seeing that in, institutional players are, are asking of you and your company, and where do, where do you think it's going? Um, yeah, so um, also to kind of maybe shed a little bit more color on what Copper is, so we started four and a half years ago. Um, Four of us in a cool flat in Shoreditch with a whiteboard trying to figure out how to rewire um, financial services because there is a lot to be done, quite frankly. 
um, having worked in on the buy and sell side, you know, somebody punching in a trade on a Wednesday and then like headless chickens, three floors above, people are running around for several days trying to settle that trade um, is retarded, quite frankly, um, in the realm where techno technologically we should be able to do better. So um, apart from at that time, end of 17, there was nothing around on the custody side. Um, that was the first thing we needed to solve. Um, having picked up the phone, I remember a conversation which was hilarious at that time. Um, I was at an SM manager and I called up and said, like, we tried to get exposure, we're looking for a custodian. And the guy on the other line said, what's a custodian? We're a wallet. And I'm like, what the hell's a wallet? Like, there was nothing there. So institutional adoptions, even though we've been sitting on panels for the last four years and everybody has been hailing this, hasn't happened up until about six to nine months ago. Now, what we are doing is, like what you earlier said, we provide the shovels and picks, um, which can be, well, construed in different ways. The custodial layer is what powers it all. I mean, this is the very first thing. Secure custody is first part, which is not necessarily a division between hot, cold, and warm wallets. But what we have seen then towards the end of, after we launched this towards the end of 18, was that suddenly managers rocked up, which are a little bit more sophisticated than somebody that has, you know, put his bar mitzvah money into Bitcoin in 2009 and is sitting on a couple of million now. Um, and they said, look, we've got investors and they ask us questions, is there any chance for you as a manager to defraud us? Um, and given the fact that the industry has been built by technology people and not financial people, um, bridging that gap is extremely difficult. So um, you can try to wiggle yourself out of that question, but ultimately what you will have to say is yes, because the exchange account is fully owned by the manager. So we created a product called the Walt Garden at that time. Um, so funds can travel freely within, jointly controlled with the, um, uh, with the custodian. Um, and then it kind of evolved from there. So we were thinking, why are exchanges custodian? Which in our opinion is a really, 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 really stupid idea, but that's a different story. And uh, in order to solve this, looking at DTCC and Euroclear models, we created a product called Clearloop. Um, and that basically is the ability for you to hold assets in custody, just delegate that to the venue, which is available in milliseconds, you execute and settle post-trade at the custodian. The thing is built in a way that it's supposed to be multi-custodial, multi-venue. Um, so far, technologically, um, not many custodians are up to par in order to manage this, uh, but I'm excited and I'm sure it will happen sooner or later. Um, yeah, so. That's just parts of it, and DeFi staking, all that kind of stuff that comes on top for yield generation, which is extremely important for clients right now. But from an infrastructural perspective, in order to make sure that the space grows, those are like the absolute core basics that you need to get right. Um, because at that point, you can also have different conversations with regulators, because this is something that looks and smells and feels like what they roughly know. And trying to squeeze a square peg through a round hole is also a very stupid idea. So we need to kind of rethink um, of how this is done, which is a large part of what we're doing right now in terms of like helping regulators to understand that too. And that kind of covers it in a nutshell. There's much more, but yeah. Thanks for that. So yeah, it does seem like institutional investors, most of them, you know, they have a background in traditional assets. And yet, like you were saying, people like to work with things that they know. Uh, they don't want to reinvent the wheel. And so Sam, I'm wondering from an investment standpoint, what, what are some of the things from traditional uh, investment thesis, some of the things from traditional finance that carry over to the crypto space and what's unique about crypto in your mind? Yeah, I think, um, uh, well, finding the right opportunities for us has really been finding things that look and feel in a way like things we've already done and invested in the past. And so um, figuring out, okay, well, you know, credit, for example, what's really the, the underwritable risk uh, behind this, this credit agreement and loan and uh, and in the trading side, um, a part of that for us has been a strategy where we're focusing on, um, because you know I think a lot of the managing a, a strategy in digital assets is just like managing a strategy in FX or macro and a lot of other w strategies as well in terms of sensible risk management, uh, identification of downside loss across different trades and instruments, trying to diversify smartly and wisely across geographies or. Um, instruments, in this case, you know, currencies uh, uh, or, or, or digital assets, and then also exchanges and um, timescales, etc. So um, our preference has been to focus on strategies that are um, managed in part or, or in whole by uh, experienced portfolio managers that may come from a tra more traditional asset and are in our coming over versus more of a technologist uh, crowd and approach. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of the special um, attributes of, of digital currencies, um, 
the volatility is really high, uh, and so that has it, it sort of a, set, a special puts it in a special category in terms of sizing it carefully, um, thinking about uh, what that downside is really like, um, and, and really acknowledging that it is a volatile asset, and you know it's not always going to go up, and and uh, but that you know when that just creates from the opportunities because. You, you, you know, when it goes down, we can uh, trade out of it. Um, liquidity dries up, and, um, and and so you know that's. But th those are some of the things we've been focused on. Yeah, in addition to the volatility, I think lately what we've seen in, in some of the downturn, some of the issues that have arisen in the market seem to be a little more, uh, yes, the volatility, but uh, the, uh, the, the liquidity has been an issue, right? And, and when you leave some of the top two, three, four coins, the liquidity can quickly become an issue when the market is, is running. And so, Chad, I wonder, you know, where you're, where you're sitting, how, how do you think about liquidity provisioning in, in crypto? Yeah, so, you know, kind of comparing, again, where I've come from, which is foreign exchange, to crypto, um, it's fairly akin to G10, so Euro, Yen, are your kind of like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then EM, so your kind of, you know, Turkey, South Africa, etc., are kind of your altcoins, right? So where we kind of think about this and where the, the kind of parallels are very similar is when you're running a foreign exchange over the counter electronic market making book, your goal is to internalize risk as much as possible. So your goal is to cross client flow as much as possible so you don't have to hit exchanges for liquidity um, and you can retain spread, right? So, um, you know, where it makes it more challenging in crypto is volatility. Um, and just getting that base of client flow in. Um, but what is, you know, I think particularly interesting uh, on our side is how Galaxy is pitching itself uh, from the liquidity provider standpoint. Because this statement's gonna be for our electronic business, but it's also for our manual business, both on uh, spot and derivatives. We're pitching and we're viewed in the marketplace as the, risk, the ultimate risk warehouser, the risk warehouser of last resort. So when you do want to trade a block of risk, we are there. You know, our head of our, der our derivatives business used to run the foreign exchange division at Barclays. So we have a lot of people that have done kind of the TradFi comparable background in that. So really what, what I get really excited about in terms of our position in this marketplace, especially in the kind of current macro environment, is when clients want to have some risk to move, who's going to be able to kind of handle that on a proper scale? And, you know, Galaxy is one of the best places for that. Great. Thanks. And is in keeping with the theme of, you know, what's the same from traditional finance, what's different about crypto, Jenna, maybe you can get, share some thoughts about what's different in a crypto exchange versus a traditional exchange and what's the same? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess for us, we entered the crypto market as exchange operators. Um, and really, Bitcoin, dollar, and Ethereum dollar, they're just in a long list with cable and dollar yen and all the other foreign exchange pairs, very much um, along the same lines as what Chad said. What is key for us has been the institutional grade infrastructure. So low latency, which hasn't really been too much of a thing so far in crypto, it's key, right? Market efficiency. If Bitcoin falls by 10,000 or a lot more like it has done in the last few weeks. We have to have markets that are open and that are liquid. We cannot go into maintenance like some of the crypto exchanges do because really they are built for um, website traffic. So how many millions of people can go to a retail crypto exchange's website and it look good? These guys are very, very good at sales and marketing. They can onboard an individual with a selfie on your mobile phone and that's fantastic but that doesn't really help the institutional counterparties who want to trade crypto. They need stability, they need liquidity, and you know, that's essential for them, for the whole institutional adoption to, to take place. Thanks, thanks. So let's shift gears a little bit. I think one of the other things that institutional investors are really seeking and, and desire before they come into the space in a large way is kind of regulatory certainty, um, you know, what, what not just in the United States, but around the globe. And so, Boris, I mean, from your seat at a, at a custodian shop, what do, you what do you see and what are you thinking about as far as 
regulations? We think about it a lot, um, but the problem is there is not much in place. Um, so, like basically, all the topics that we discussed right now, those are like those are one of the core questions that they have to answer before they can go into a proper framework. So, capital efficiency is one of the things. Like, it's great to be able to. Uh, um, the scale is not really available if you have to, you know, pre-fund. That's that's the very first little hurdle that you need to overcome because that automatically enables you to um, offer different instruments, you know, swaps, ETFs, less so, but also here you have got liquidity constraints. So when it, when it, when it comes to this, like those are the core things that you need to kind of solve first. Um, now, from a pure custodial perspective, um, I mean, that kind of is set in stone in terms of how safe custody is regulated in the traditional space. Um, but, uh, of course, the mechanics are different. So. The next problem is that you've got insane fragmentation. Like the US is ahead in certain areas, then the, the European Union is miles behind, the FCA is getting their head around right now, APAC is doing very exotic stuff, uh, uh, which is very specific pinpoint, mainly in around execution and retail. So it's very hard to kind of get a common framework, especially if you deal with, um, if you deal with an, with an, with an inf infrastructure is the wrong word, but with a with with a topic that is pure, so properly global, uh, um, in and around how to transmit money, how do you do this? Like, how are you making sure that this is happening in a regulated manner? So, there are so many questions to answer, um, and what we are currently doing is just literally work that through bit by bit with the regulators um, um, out of our. I, I actually don't know what the latest number is, we're like 350, 400 people now. A considerable amount of people are currently literally engaged with all the various regulators and just literally do this step by step, day by day. Um, and yeah, so I don't see this happening very quickly. What happened right now, MacroWise is potentially going to actually accelerate this a little bit because they will, you know, it will free up and kind of show that we can do things better. Um, and quite frankly, they had enough time to think about it already. So um, I'm expecting some good things to happen in the course of the next two to three years. Great, thanks. Jenna, how do you think about regulation with, with respect to your customers and also the product offerings you're able to bring the market? Yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree with Boris. I mean, for now, we don't really have much of an option other than to follow any jurisdictional frameworks that pop up. And as they arrive with their principles or, or whatever um, the framework is, you have to turn up in that country and get yourself regulated and follow that. Um, but I guess what's key is for some renowned regulators to step up to the mark. And, and we're starting to see a few items, but it, I think we're a good few years away. Um, so we just have to sort of carry on as we are. Um, but yeah, to be honest, Boris nailed it. It's what it is for now. Hey, and, and Boris, the, the other big one for institutional investors, the safety and security. What do you think we can do as an industry regarding safety and security to spur on widespread institutional adoption? Uh, good question. Can I ask you back, like, what exactly do you mean? Because it, it's like when it, when it comes to security, there are various ways of how you can do it, right? Um, you deal with a cryptographic asset. You need to make sure that this alphanumerical, this, this alphanumerical string is safe and quickly accessible, especially due to high volatility, um, uh, which like there, there are various ways of how you can do this. We have chosen to go down the route the MPC way. Um, which stands for multi-party computation, so uh, a private key is never created as a whole centrally. Um, you create shards that have never come together at any point, which means there is no central vector of attack. Um, so security always goes hand in hand with, which is interesting what we've seen. So we currently service around 650, 700 clients, whereas about, we only touch institutional, so we don't touch retail. Whereas about 75 of them are crypto funds, market makers, HFTs, prop shops. That's so trading firms. And what we've seen over the course of the last like two, three years where other providers were out on the market in order to give access quick, um, the, ultimate, the ultimate ruling comes from the investor. If the investor says that there is any flaw in and around the DDQ that has to be done by your service provider, 
you cannot use it. It is as simple as. I mean, I, th I think the most regulated space on this front is is the ETF space because even end of day, you need to have the assets settled and in custody. Um, so that's why it comes down to like speed, access, uh, um, and ultimately, like what we basically are are a is, a, is a security firm. That's 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 ultimately what we are. About twenty five percent of the workforce are security, and they do very very scary things. And I can tell you that very very scary things are being thrown at us consistently, um, good friends in North Korea and other places, like consistently. But if you don't have a central point that can be attacked and you need to work yourself through layers, um, mathematically you end up in a situation where the likelihood of something going wrong is in the power of 10 to minus 24, 25. So very, very, very low. Um, so um, security is paramount, but it always is a, is a, a um, kind of a balance act between Am I so secure that I have to send a guy into a Swiss mountain and I now need to wait 72 hours for my assets to be withdrawn? Or um, is there a trade-off in order to be able to do this fast and still secure? Um, and that's, that balance act is quite difficult to hit. For the capital market side and anything actively trading, we seem to have nailed that. Great. Yeah, so I can see the, the challenge that, that that presents. So we've talked about li liquidity, security, uh, regulatory, uh, but, but Sam, I'm wondering from, from, as an investor, what is it that your team looks at? What's the characteristics uh, that your team is combing over when they're considering a digital asset investment? Yeah, I think um, uh, a lot of what we look at is what we also look at for traditional assets. Um, so in terms of uh, the team, the background, uh, the strategy, we're looking for an edge, we're, look, we're look, combing through the data. Um, looking at daily returns, looking for uh, what the sensitivity is to macro risk factors. Um, it, you know, crypto is a little bit different in that uh, there isn't necessarily a beta to um, crypto. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different uh, ways to define what that is. And, and so sorting through, um, translating things like momentum and, and value factors into, into crypto is a little bit uh, tricky sometimes, but um, but really what we're trying to tease out is how sensitive is this return stream to different economic environments and those shifting um, just as we would with any other uh, hedge fund strategy. Um, you know, I think the operational due diligence part is a key difference as well in crypto, uh, and, and there's a lot of complexity there in terms of the regulatory complexity, um, custody, um, exchange risk. And, um, and and look, there's some there's some good um, uh, solutions and and uh, in terms of strategies about how to deal with these issues, but they remain and it is it is a complexity that investors have to deal with. At the same time, I would say the complexity creates the opportunity. So that's really why um, uh, you know acting acting in a prudent manner, a thoughtful manner, but trying to be engaged early on in the in the process and looking for opportunities. Is, uh, is paid for us with other similar situations in the past, and so that's why we're engaged and, and looking and, and focused on this. Thanks for that. So the, one of the main questions, the key questions that I have for each of you, and I'd like you all to, to share your, your thoughts, is what, what, what are the, the, the kind of the key barriers that you see currently to institutional adoption, and what can we do about them, if, if anything? Jenna, maybe we'll start with you. Um, so we've covered most of them. Regulation technology infrastructure, security, and Boris briefly touched on credit intermediation. That's a massive one for us. As we try to onboard institutions, they're pretty set in their ways about how they trade other asset classes. And it typically, you know, in foreign exchange in particular, it happens via a prime broker. And that really is a firm, typically a bank, that will give them credit access to multiple venues and they'll face that credit intermediator. Um, and in crypto, it, it's not really there yet. There are a lot of firms that are trying to offer prime services. Um, but if you take a, a large asset manager, for example, they, they quite like to use their traditional methods. Um, and not having that and having to face an exchange directly will be very tough for them, near on impossible. Um, and it's inefficient, right? So even if you forget about the funds and asset managers and you think about high-frequency traders who are pretty active in the market today, 
if they want to market make on 30 different exchanges in crypto, they have to fund 30 of them. I mean, that just doesn't work in the grand scheme of things. And yeah, they'll have relationships with different exchanges where they get given sort of different credit lines. Some of them will allow them to settle post-trade. I mean, that's not something we would do. Um, but until we get that real prime solution where the prime broker or the credit intermediator is taking risk on the credit side, I think that's one of the biggest barriers for true institutions to enter the market. Thanks, that's great. Chad, what do you think? Yeah, I, I just echo Jenna's point, particularly on the prime broker piece. Um, few firms trying to do it in their own way, but that's something that I think is a is a pretty big Not block. Not well. Yeah, pretty big block. Yeah, pretty big blocker in this space. The other piece I touch on that um, a few people have mentioned is just the operational complexity piece. Um, you know, again, comparing back to to foreign exchange, like you know, if you if you want to trade on exchanges, you need to post inventory, how you manage that, how efficient you are at that. And that's actually something I've found that can differentiate a provider other than price is basically how operationally efficient are you? How automated are you on your settlement? Uh, which is something that you know we take, we take particular pride in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess just you know, echoing kind of the points on just general, you know, these these market conditions, um, you know, this past week and a half or so, where it's been particularly precarious in the macro environment, seen almost in my 12 months here as much, uh, you know, in, you know, institutional inquiry on on us and client inquiry, which I think is a factor of a couple things. One of which is many providers are backing out in these environments, and that's where we're here. Um, but I also think it's kind of, you know, there, there is this opportunity set out there and there, there is this need for a, you know, key providers that can offer you an array of services, um, which is what, you know, Galaxy can do. It's one, one quick follow-up, Chad. You know, on the point of the prime broker, that missing component that's here, I mean, would it be helpful, do you think, or hurtful that if a big balance sheet provider type of bank uh, came into the market uh, in, in that space? Yeah, I, I mean, so there's a couple names out there that I won't name here, but that have big balance sheets and are trying to basically leverage that to do that credit, sorry, that intermediation piece. But again, like it still is remaining to be seen how well that can be done. Um, so, and Sam, can you share your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, one of the practical issues we've run into is just capacity available in some of these strategies, which, uh, you know, there. It, it, again, is the opportunity because it means there's not a lot of capital there. It's limited, um, but I think for it to really grow as an asset class, that you know the liquidity um, underneath that needs to continue to grow. Um, I, you know, it's hard to say how the market will evolve. I think there are some encouraging um, uh, signals in, in there. Uh, one of which is the with the migration of talent uh, from traditional asset classes and hedge funds in particular into the digital space. Um, this migration of talent is really why I personally became interested in taking a closer look at this uh, more recently because I just have seen uh, a lot of really talented um, researchers, portfolio managers, uh, systematic uh, former colleagues of mine uh, go over and, and be involved in some way. Um, and so I expect that you know that will lead to, um, th that will help develop the industry. I think the other um, aspect of it, somewhat ironically, is that uh, I think institutional investors are waiting for the asset class, to, quote unquote, to be proven uh, and to weather storms. And so, uh, even though some of these recent uh, periods have shown, you know, the, the downside of volatility, I think it's also uh, part of any cleansing that that you know, that goes along when you have a lot of exuberance, a lot of capital flows that really needs to happen for that model, that asset class to really be proven. And the final one would just be time, which takes data. You know, institutional investors need to know if this is, is this an inflation hedge, is this, is, is this a substitute for gold? You know, how does this fit in portfolios? And, and I think a lot of that it still hasn't been sorted out yet. Thanks, and Boris? Um, well, I mean, 
the prime piece is huge uh, to the point of like migration of talent. This is like what we have been focused on. Like, actually, back there, you see his, his face poking out around the corner. Um, Michael, who was the former head of prime at BAML, who has joined Copper for the head of prime, as the head of prime uh, for the infrastructure and other very exciting things that we're going to be releasing soon. But um, people need to understand that we're currently in a, in, a, in a phase where the market is still completely retail driven. Elon Musk having a spliff too much and then quoting and tweeting out that something is that he doesn't like sending the market down by 5% is not 10% is not okay. So, but then again, well, people also have to understand that this is a new technology. Um, if you go online and you watch a YouTube video where, where Bill Gates was explaining the internet to, I think it was Conan O'Brien, he was laughing about it, that this will never take off. It's, those things are natural, and what you're dealing with at first is that you have a mass of retail investors in this space. And when, we, when you deal with 90% plus retail, um, you, you are incurring those things. Um, but the good thing, as data shows us, is um, because the equity markets did the same, just from the 1920s all the way to the 2000s. Um, but it took time. Uh, in this case, we're doing this, you can actually calculate it out, it kind of comes out at about 15, 16 times speed. Um, so at that rate, um, with what is happening right now, is literally just like pushing out more retail and allowing, opening the gate for, you know, big institutions to come in because what they love, not, they don't love anything more than volatility. So this, is, so this is ultimately what is happening now and I think will continue to happen over the course of the next uh, um, uh, um, one, two years. It, 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 it really depends. What you also see is that correlation that goes up because um, when the tech stocks are crunching down on the NASDAQ, it's very interesting to see of how quickly crypto is following. Um, in order to potentially cover margin calls or whatever else it is. But that also means that you've got big players in the game already, and I can show you they're already there. It's not with the flagship fund. That is, it's, it's, it's a separate entity uh, set up offshore in order to kind of do this with prop money. But they're already there. Uh, um, it's just like waiting for the right spark. So, and what is one of the key things is Prime. But what the Prime offerings that, you, that label themselves Prime nowadays they are not, uh, um, because they deal still with the underlying infrastructural issue of having to pre-fund venues, which is one of the core things that doesn't allow you to scale. So uh, I'm, I'm sure when you go through the exercise of like, um, I mean, we've got several funds like 300 million plus, they literally have in their prospectus, at no point in time am I allowed to put more than 10 or 15% of my AUM on a given venue. It doesn't matter if the liquidity is great and they could make more money there, they will just, they're just not allowed to do it. So those things are the ones that we need to unlock in order to make sure that uh, this can happen all efficiently and grow. Very insightful, thank you. You know, the other thing that institutional investors look for, especially as the asset class matures, is trading away from spot and trading uh, in, in, in derivatives and uh, gaining other points of access, maybe nonlinear returns. Jenna, maybe you could speak to what you're seeing in the market, derivatives-wise, futures, options, things yeah, of that nature. So, so we're a spot-only venue today. However, um, plugging Elmax here, we will be launching a um, futures offering later in Q4 this year really because the regulatory determinism issue has slowed things down in terms of how quickly we thought that the likes of banks and asset managers might be able to physically trade crypto. Um, so it's kind of an interim for us if we offer a cash settled futures offering. We think that given that we make it very easy for any client of Almax Group to trade any asset class by the same API, offering them a cash settled uh, crypto offering should sort of bridge the gap so that they can engage with us in crypto. Ultimately, right now, they can trade FX to the banks and they can look at our crypto offering. Um, so the, the futures piece is an interim. They get exposure to crypto on an FCA regulated MTF. Um, they don't physically have to touch anything. I think we could be in that spot for a while given what, what we're seeing or, or not seeing on the regulation side of things. Um, so yeah, that the, the goal there is for us to offer sort of spot and futures under the one roof um, and potentially offer sort of netting advan advantages on the margin side. Great, thanks. So in our last few minutes, what I'd like to do is just come around the, the horn here and just ask, you know, some of your, your parting thoughts, what do you, what do you think we're going to see over the next 12 months? 
you know, and what you, you see coming to market? Maybe we'll start with you, Boris. Um, well, well, there will be several things that will be coming to market. Um, just to touching back on that point, I mean, if you look at the uh, um, big investment banks, there is one, one row that trades spot, and then there are 55 that are trading derivatives. Um, that's basically how the market is, and that's in many ways how it should be, because it opens optionality. So at the end of the day, this is what I see happening more of, because um, I think on the pure retail side, we're pretty well covered, even though, I mean, the latest news with things like Celsius and stuff is, is, is bad, but also necessary, because you finally see the dirt under the hood. <laughs> And there is a lot of that about. Um, so um, what I'm expecting is from a from a from a uh, infrastructure and offering perspective on the derivative side, if you want to target those big buy side players, um, you know BlackRock's book in Europe is is, is swap only. Uh, um, so something needs to be done on that front. Um, more in and around the infrastructural piece. Exchanges are slowly waking up. I mean, the SEC has, um, the, the paper that was brought out um, a couple of months ago, I think, or a couple of weeks ago, in and around how exchanges need to treat the collateral that is sitting on the venue, like, um, because some of them are waking up to the fact of like, oh, wow, there is a thing called segregation of duties, so how am I doing this? So um, I'm, I'm expecting more to happen in and around this, and then we will see most likely, um, you know, some of the people that have a lot of dirt under the hood, there will be a series of death, which is um, deaths that are necessary for the space in order to evolve. So uh, what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is not something that will, uh, um, is a singular occur uh, or, or occurrence. You will see more of that in the coming months and in, in the coming 12 months, which means that you're left with players that are actually able to service that market efficiently. Okay. Sam, your thoughts? I think it's really challenging and difficult to say uh, how everything's going to play out. Um, I'll be interested to see how it all goes. I think uh, you know there there will be potential opportunities. Um, you know th this reminds me a little bit of some of the commodity markets where you have uh, producers and you have uh, you know in some case m real miners mining metals and you have a commodity cycle and there's a cleansing of uh, of all the producers and. Uh, capital uh, gets destroyed in some cases and, and uh, production moves to the most efficient producers. And in those opportunities, there's a lot of classic distress, stressed credit type of credit, hedge fund type of opportunities there. Um, you know, I, I, personally, I'll be focused on areas where we can see real value and we don't really have to take this big macro call on exactly how it's going to play out. Great. Chad? Yeah, um, I think Sam and Boris nailed it uh, with respect to this necessary cleansing of, uh, yeah, just cleansing of what's been going on, right? Because if you think, if you take a step back from a macro side, we've had this era of free money for years and years and a lot of just aggressive chasing of, of yield and extra return. Um, and it's, it's been, you know, honed in, uh, necessarily so, right? So... Um, you know, in terms of macro, what do we need for crypto to go higher? I think it really comes down to two simple things. Inflation needs to cool off and the Fed needs to pump the brakes on rates, right? So rate expectations, Fed rate expectations, you know, knock on wood, I think are kind of, you know, coming, coming to a flat line uh, level at this stage. But, you know, that's like, what are we doing at Galaxy in the next three to six months where we're still in this tenuous kind of market environment, we're digging in. Like this is the time for us to get all of the things that we're working on from an infrastructure perspective, from the clients we're penetrating, because as both these guys to my left said, you know, clients are looking for that provider or providers that weather the storm um, and can be there in difficult conditions. And I also think the point that was made about you know, crypto making it through really tough macro times. This isn't like 2018, right, where it was crypto specific. This is like every macro asset class is struggling right now. And crypto getting through that crescendo and being able to be strong, like that's what I'm excited about at Galaxy because we are one of those providers that, you know, have been able to weather the storm and are going to be there. So. Thanks. And Jenna, you get the last word? Yeah, sure. Um, I think just to add... What's really 
in these downturns, what we tend to see is how resilient Bitcoin is, and is a, as an asset. And I think as a result of that, and we've seen it many times, we tend to get the regulators pipe up and the institutions to start querying and getting involved again. So I think we'll see that um, in the coming weeks or months. And I think all of us on the stage here are still hiring and still going strong. Um, so we'll, we'll be trying to... There is one more point, which I think is, you know, we constantly talk about Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, which is definitely important, at least for the time being. But what, you, what, what people seem to sometimes forget is the technological layer underneath, which is actually the far more interesting part, to be honest. Um, because, so, to the 12 months, what I wanted to say is, because there is active, active work already happening, some of you maybe have seen the news with State Street and us providing the infrastructure to them. Um, and there are, in the coming months, you will see many more to follow. But what it ultimately comes down to is that they, 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 they're not in the game because of Bitcoin and Ethereum. This is important to understand. They are in the game, like we initially said about when we talk about the settlement layer, uh, what the blockchain technology actually can achieve. So what we will see is, um, I'm very confident of this, over the course of the next, yeah, six to 12 months, um, the first proper um, use cases for tokenized securities um, that actually is going to be much easier for the regulator to kind of deal with as well. Um, so maybe more like for back office and, in, and, and internally for the bank, um, but you will see not just like sporadic between like SockChain and, and uh, I think it was Credit Suisse where they did a tokenized uh, um, fixed income trade, we will see much more of this um, because that's where the technology really shines. Um, and that's the really exciting part because that's where you unlock, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars that are currently, plus create optionality. So simply from a trading perspective, it's not just Apple shares against dollars, but you can then go into a tokenized insurance contract against tokenized Apple shares, things like this, which are going to be, I mean, it's very rare that we can kind of be part of that birth of something that interesting and unique. So, going to see much more of that. All right, and with that, I'd like to thank my panel members, and thank you. <laughs>